Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines. I wanted to do a, a little installment here of Nuggets of Gospel Gold. That's going to be the Monday right. podcast and video that I do. And uh, just wanted to read a, just a few verses and make a few comments uh, on one of my favorite passages of, of Scripture, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, it's one thing that we think about a lot is what do we have? What, what do I have? And people think a lot about, well, I have my health, and I have a job, and I have money in the bank, and I have a car that runs and I have a house that I live in, and I have a wife, and I have children, and I have a church here that I, I pastor, and I have clothes, and I have food at home, and I have Bibles, and I have all these things. Those are all great. Those are all wonderful things for a person to have. And there's a passage of scripture uh, that is in the book of Proverbs, and I'll tell you, the book of Proverbs, as I read it, and I've read it to the kids at home, and um, over the years, and this, it's a, a great thing to do, um, to learn the wisdom of God in the book of Proverbs. There's a, a passage, every time I read it, I think about this, Proverbs 13, 7, there is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing. And one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. Now, that's not just trying to sound profound, it, it, is, it is profound. Because I think what that's talking about there is knowing Christ and knowing the true God and having him as the greatest of all riches. There's one who makes himself rich in this world, one who works themselves to the bone and never takes a rest and is constantly obsessing about their things and their stuff. And uh, is obsessed with money and getting ahead and bigger and faster, better stuff. Yet they have nothing. They have nothing. And one who makes himself poor, in other words, they don't value those things of this world as idols. They don't value the, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and all of those things. And yet they have great riches. I remember seeing a video about a tribe in uh, Papua New Guinea called the Taliabu people. And missionaries went there, and it took them a while to learn the language. They had a very strange tonal language, and it was really hard to learn it. And one of the people in that tribe that came to Christ, they highlighted her. Um, it was one of the most moving things I've ever seen in my life. This woman had leprosy, and because of that, she lived by herself out away from the village. And her only possession, the only thing that she had was a tree bark dress. Like literally the bark off of a tree was the only thing that she had. And she would wear that. And her fingers were all gone and her toes were all gnarled and she had, you know, the sores and everything that lepers have. And when the missionaries came, you know, the people that would take her food occasionally, there were people from the village that had compassion on her and would, they would take her food. That's how she stayed alive, but she lived by herself because she was a leper. They decided to go ahead and, and come get her and bring her to these meetings. And they interviewed her because she came to know Christ and was baptized. And she talked about how, you know, people look at me and they, they see I, I don't have anything. And she says, even, even this body that I have is falling apart but now I have everything. Now I have true riches. And I just sat there like watching this 
it's just like tears flowing out of my eyes like how do i find find it in myself to complain about anything when i have this i have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in christ every spiritual blessing what are some of those spiritual blessings i have justification god has legally declared me righteous because i am in christ because he showed me my sin he granted me saving faith in the lord jesus and him alone i have no confidence in the flesh i have no boasting whatsoever in myself in my heart my intentions nothing my confidence for going to heaven rests solely completely and only on the finished work of the lord jesus christ and because of that once god grants that saving faith and repentance unto life that grieving and grieving over and hating sin and you you turn from sin to follow christ you'll never do it perfectly but you're not the slave of sin anymore and god grants that saving faith where you're not working for salvation you're not trying to earn your way to, to heaven or anything like that you just rest on the finished work of christ god justifies you you go from being condemned by the law to being declared righteous because the righteousness of the lord jesus the righteousness of God that is revealed in the gospel is imputed into your legal account before God. And now you have, as the great Charles Hodge said in his systematic theology long ago, you now have a legal title to eternal life. I have that because I have the Lord Jesus. Along with every other spiritual blessing, what are some of those other blessings? I have adoption. God has also uh, done another transaction, another legal transaction that's uh, today if you adopt a child or adopt somebody it's done in a court with a judge and a verdict it's the same thing with this once god changes our legal status from condemned by the law to justified before the law by the righteousness of christ and his cross being accepted as the full payment for all of our sins original actual past present and future all nailed to the cross all gone for eternity he adopts us into his family he doesn't leave us orphans he doesn't leave us under the dominion of the devil or under his ownership. He adopts us into his family and we become his children. And that's why Christians instinctively refer to each other as brothers and sisters. And I'll tell you, what a blessing it is to have brothers and sisters all over the place. And there are brothers and sisters that, you know, through, through the use of technology, this is how you make technology work for you, not against you. You get to meet Christians on the internet that have the same uh, savior that you do and love the same Lord that you do and have the same affection for the one true God that you do and, and love his word like you do. There's a lot of people I've never even met them face to face. Uh, and yet I love them dearly, brothers and sisters in the Lord. I have that too. If you're a Christian, you have that too. That's why you've got to find a church. You got to be part of a, of a local fellowship so you have Christian friends and Christian family that you talk to and that you know. And, you know, I don't know everybody in, in the church here. I wish I did. But I'm very, very thankful to God for every one of them, for all of them. It says that this choice of God, this unconditional electing grace was done in Christ. We were given to Christ as John 6, 37 through 39, John 17, verse 2, and John chapter 10, verses 15, really through 31, that whole block of text there. Um, we were given to Christ before time began. We were given to him and trusted to him before the foundation of the world, before creation. And we were predestined to be adopted. And we were given to Christ so that we would be holy and blameless. That's talking about justification. We're predestined to be adopted as sons by Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Uh, reflect on that for a moment. Why does God save us? Why does God save undeserving sinners like ourselves? To the praise of the glory of his grace. Why does God save mean scoundrels and sinners like us? To glorify his grace. I know I glorify God's grace. If you're a Christian and you know what's in your heart and you know how sinful you can be and you know how sinful your thoughts can turn and you reflect on the things you've done in your life or have done in the last 24 hours, it, it does glorify God's grace. And that's another reason our works play no role in this at all. 
Because if our works saved us in some way, then it wouldn't glorify God's grace. It wouldn't be grace anymore. By which he made us accepted in the beloved. What does that mean? Accepted in the beloved. Really, that's a, what's called a, a substantival adjective, the beloved one. Who's the beloved one? Jesus. Remember at the baptism of the Lord Jesus? What did God the Father say from heaven after John baptized Jesus? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God can't look at me and look at you and ourselves and say, that's my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased, or that's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He can't say that about me because I'm sinful. He can't say that about um, any women either. They're sinful. Jesus is the only one, the only man in history that God the Father could look upon and say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And when we go from being in Adam to being in Christ, we are accepted in the beloved one because he puts us in union with Christ under his federal covenantal headship. We go from being in Adam to being in Christ. And once you're in Christ, you're accepted by God forever, no matter who you are or what you've done. If you're in Christ, you are accepted. You are justified. You have every spiritual blessing. You are adopted as a child of God. And none of those things can ever be revoked. When you think about what you have in life in terms of your possessions, here we have the, the true riches. Listen, in fact, it's even called that, verse 7. In him, in Christ, in the beloved one, we have redemption through his blood. What's the price tag on that? Psalm 49 says that no one can redeem the life of his brother, for the cost is too high. <laughs> Way too high. But it was paid by the Lord Jesus. We have redemption through his blood. That was the price. His shed blood, his death, purchased redemption from the curse of God, from the curse of the law when he died for us. We have redemption. Do you have that? I'll take that over everything Elon Musk and Bill Gates have in this world, or George Soros, or the richest people who have ever lived, or the most powerful people who have ever lived. They can keep their money. They can keep their fame and their power. He who has Christ has redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Do you understand the richness of God's generosity to his beloved people? It's worth more than all the wealth, all the pleasure, all the fame and glory of man, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. It's infinitely more valuable than anything the world could ever give you. You have every spiritual blessing if you're a Christian in the heavenly places because you're in Christ. And you have that holy and blameless status because of your justification. You have the adoption. You are a child of God, not a child of darkness, not a child of the devil, a child of God. Remember what Jesus told his enemies in John chapter 8? You are of your father, the devil, and his will you want to do. But if you're a Christian, what did Jesus teach his people? You pray, our Father, who art in heaven. That's an intimacy of fellowship with the one true God that is unknown in man's religions. Because man's religions can't give you peace with God, because none of them know God. But if you know the truth, and you know the true Jesus, the true gospel, and you're relying on Christ, relying on Christ alone, you are accepted in the beloved, in him. You have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. There is one who makes himself rich in this world and yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor yet has great riches. Do you have those great riches? The richness of his grace, which he made to abound toward us, it says in verse 8. Do you have forgiveness of sins? Do you have justification? Do you have adoption? Do you have every spiritual blessing in Christ? 
I pray and hope so. And if you do, whatever trials you got going on, whatever heartaches you have going on, make sure you take time today to reflect on that passage, Ephesians 1, 3 through 7, and just soak it in and just rejoice in it. You have the true riches. You have the true riches. There's one who makes himself rich yet has nothing. And one who makes himself poor yet has great riches. He who has Christ always, always has great riches. Thanks for watching or listening.